Welcome. For the first time this year, Rotary opens opportunities to strengthen leadership, put service ideas into action, and enrich the lives of those in need. Please welcome your new president for her maiden voyage, Heidi Unferdorven. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful uh, to see you all. Um, I can just see your faces. Some of you are eating, drinking, really lovely, and um, um, look forward to a great meeting today. This, we hope, will be our final online meeting. Um, and we were talking just before today's meeting that we may still Zoom our meetings, um, but this, we hope, will be our final um, online-only meeting. Um, so welcome everybody today and especially to our guest speaker Darren Cahill who will be more formally introduced by Peter Neal later. Also welcome to all, all our other guests, visiting Rotarians and any guests of Rotarians who may be enjoying our online lunch meeting today. We have some birthdays in the club um, as always. We have Paul Greenaway whose birthday was yesterday. Paul's a friend of Rotary and Rob Falconer and Alex Grosman, who have birthdays tomorrow. So happy birthday if, um, if you're online today. And anniversaries, Simon Derek Roberts, four years. Raphaela Ost, four years. Dean Brazier, 11 years. And Bob Hecker, 47 years, which is an absolutely incredible achievement. So I don't think, no, Bob's online today but um, certainly let's give him a round of applause if he watches this later on. Well done, 47 years. Um, just a few other announcements. Um, can you, uh, I remind all our members to please check the bulletin, Facebook or WhatsApp for any messages. And I also invite you all to contribute to our community projects by placing donations in the online donation bowl. Uh, the link is in the bulletin and I'll also put that up in, um, in a few minutes. Um, a really uh, fantastic um, announcement to make, of course, for those who haven't heard yet, is that we are going back to Adelaide Oval next week. Uh, Trevor Sterling, our new secretary, has contacted them this morning, so we've got the most up-to-date information as possible for you all. Um, uh, it's still going ahead, definitely, in the McLaughlin room, so that's in the Western Stand. We do have to have uh, final numbers, though, to Adelaide Oval by Monday. So we are asking everybody to please book online for this meeting to avoid any cash handling at the desk um, or credit card handling. Um, but the main thing is that Adelaide Oval need to have numbers by Monday. So if people do um, aren't able to pay online and would prefer to pay by credit card tap and um, on, on Wednesday, that's okay. Just let us know if you're coming and we'll make sure we have a uh, seat for you. Um, and we also need to know dietary requirements. So the online booking is open on our event page, so please make sure you go in there and book and you get a bit of a discount, just to remind you or two if you pre-book anyway. $3 discount. I'd like to also remind everybody that um, today is the official day of the, the new district, District 9510. So uh, it's um, a real um, milestone, I suppose, within, um, within our Rotary Clubs here within South Australia. But for those of you who aren't aware, District 9510 is the merger of the two districts that have been in South Australia for quite a while. So 9510 and 9500. 9510 is in between the two numbers and that's where the new name came from. Now that area actually encompasses a huge area of Australia. It encompasses most of South Australia. Sunraysia, so areas around Mildura in Victoria. Alice Springs and Broken Hill. So we're across four states, which um, which is wonderful. So it just has made our Rotary family even even bigger. And um, we encourage once borders open for people to to connect with one another. And if you're going to um, going to be visiting either of those states, pop in and say hi to your fellow Rotarians. So as of today, uh, David Jones. Uh, 
unofficially, but officially is our new district governor and he has invited us all to the um, online in um, changeover meeting this Sunday from 2 to 4 p.m. So uh, I think everybody has received an email about that. Uh, so if you can join, please feel free to. Uh, in, if you haven't got the link to the Zoom changeover meeting for the district and would like it, please just let me know and I'll forward that to you. Um, uh, I'll be online and uh, I encourage everyone to join in to celebrate this historic occasion and open the opportunities Rotary offers to enrich our lives and the communities we serve. Um, I think that's about all I need to let you know about. Um, next week, uh, as I said, we are back at Adelaide Oval, so we'll talk a little bit more um, when we meet face to face about the new Rotary theme for the year, Rotary Opens Opportunities. So you can see the banner here. So I think in about in the next 24 hours, Holger Knapp will become our new uh, Rotary International President as well. And that theme will come in and you can watch that online as well for the first time. So um, join in. I think it's two o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, so if I see any of you online at two o'clock tomorrow morning, <laughs> I'll say hi. Um, and just finally, I just wanted to let you know that um, on July the 15th, we've been very fortunate to uh, only just have it confirmed yesterday that Jane Doyle um, will be our um, uh, will be joining us to interview me in a meet the president um, style on the couch um, chat. So Jane Doyle from Channel Seven, who we all know and love, will be conducting that interview. So hopefully you'll all be there on July the fifteenth. Um, I think that's about all. I will chat with you more as um, uh, at the end of the meeting and in enjoy the rest of uh, the meeting. I'm now going to hand back to Peter Neal, who will introduce Spotlight on Service. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Heidi. And just a reminder to uh, put your view on speaker view, uh, to mute for those who have just joined us recently. And also a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be available online later. Our Spotlight on Service segment is an opportunity to hear about what we're doing in Rotary and our club. Uh, Heidi's mentioned some wider Rotary issues, but our club issues at the moment are very much focused on a particular project that I'm going to, again, hand over this week to talk about the Something Wild Yogurt Drive and raising funds for our nurture kids handing over to Joe Fiedler from the Adelaide, from Rotary Adelaide Innovation Group. Over to you, Joe. Uh, hello, everybody. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, share my screen. So bear with me for a second, see if I can do this right. Uh, on, I think, how'd, what, how'd I go? My... Not yet. Not yet. Coming in now, you're right. All right, you can see me? Yep. Okay. So uh, for those who don't know what Nurture Kits for Nurses is, basically uh, the Calvary Hospital through Belinda Chapman contacted us about putting together some little Nurture Kits for maybe nurses that have had a bad day or have had a bit of trauma at their workplace. So we have been collecting over the last few months and even before uh, COVID, collecting lots of products for these boxes and just a couple of weekends we put them together. So we've got about 60 odd boxes ready to go to Calvary North Adelaide. So they'll go to the managers there and if, if a nurse has a rough day, then they'll be given one of these boxes. So it's all about going home, putting their feet up and just sort of forgetting about the day that they've just had. Um, so the people that are involved in this are the innovation group, which that's kind of our primary project at the moment and Calvary Hospital of course are being involved. We've got a couple of schools that are also help, helping out. So those bookmarks you can see are from Elizabeth Grove Primary School and then um, Gawler High School have also been helping out with a few of the products that go in there and putting the boxes together. So at the moment to raise a bit of money, we are going to do a yogurt drive. So we're sort of in the middle of this yogurt drive and it finishes today. So it's been on Facebook and through the bulletin, but if anybody wants to order them, I'll still be taking orders today. So 
we're partnering up with Something Wild, which is an Indigenous um, company in Adelaide. And it was for NATO Week, but NATO Week has actually been postponed. So, but we're still going to keep going with the fundraiser. So there's four flavours and you can either order a dozen of one flavour or a dozen of a mixed mixed flavours. So they're meant to be extremely delicious and they've got Fleur and Milk yogurt in them. So I know that is a really good brand. So it's a great South Australian company and 50 cents from every uh, yogurt goes back to Nurture Kids. So if um, you want to order some of those, just let me know. Here's some ways you can sort of contact me. But also we're always looking for donation of items that can go in there or if you want to sponsor the project and we've got a, a link if you want to donate funds. We've just started a new uh, email address, the innovation at rotary.com.au. So you can contact me if you want to do orders and I'll also hang around at the end of uh, this meeting if you want to talk to me or put in an order. And if you want to keep in contact with what's going on with Nurture Kits, then there's a Facebook page as well. So yeah, let me know and I will put in the order by the end of today. So let me know if that is something that you want to do. That's it from me. Thanks, Jo. Well done. Could you stop sharing? That'd be great. That's great. And a wonderful photograph there of a terrific uh, sporting family who are adding the flavours to these wonderful yogurts uh, in the Motlops. And uh, funnily enough, uh, a linking theme to, to my suspenders and David Egan's hat and uh, in recognition of some of the... Some of the uh, the work that our guest today is a board member of Port Adelaide. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the motlops are, are good and, and the, the flavours are fabulous, I'm, I'm told. Uh, Rotarians and guests, we're delighted today to have with us Darren Cale, one of us, one of the great icons of world international tennis, tennis, but more importantly, a really nice guy. His expansive bio has been shared with you already and rather than list it here, let's get stuck into our conversation straight up. Welcome, Darren. G'day, Pete. How's it going? Hello, everyone. We're all well and great to see you. Darren, I thought we might start off by looking back a bit retrospectively and the early days in, in Adelaide. You were born on Grand Final Day. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about your early days of sport and school and so on? I don't remember that day, Pete. So it was a long time ago, in 65, October 2. And I think I was born at about 1 p.m. on Saturday afternoon. And Dad was going down to play with Port Adelaide against Sturt in one of the grand finals. And I think it was one of the last ones they won for quite a few years before we finally broke through again in, in 77. But uh, you're right, uh, born into a Port Adelaide family. So black and white's been running through my veins for many, many years and still does. And more than likely, uh, it always fate was going to be that I was going to be a football player but as it turned out I ended up playing tennis simply because of my dad's love of tennis which I'm not sure a lot of people know but he was a lefty and the moment that he got a, a little bit of success and made his first bit of money he bought a, a couple of blocks of land down at West Lakes and built a beautiful house and put a tennis court on the second block and I reckon I was about 10 years old at that stage and and then every night after that he and I were on the back court playing and he was a big Rod Laver fan and a lefty with a big forehand and loved to serve in volleys. So because of his love of tennis, I kind of just morphed into the tennis game and that's how my career started from there. And uh, you uh, had a chance to uh, uh, leap that your father's uh, ability and Rod Laver at a presentation in New York, I, I understand. Yeah, so I've been working for ESPN now for ooh, about... 15 years across in the US and I'm part of the tennis commentary team and with that I do a lot of the presenting a lot of the analysis I'll be the courtside reporter we'll do the interviewing on the court after the matches so my, my role with ESPN is quite rounded and I got asked about a year or so ago it was the 50 year anniversary of Rod Laver winning his Grand Slam in 1969 so we actually celebrated that in New York last year. And because of the celebration, the International Hall of Fame decided they would like to get an Australian to actually MC the night, interview Rod and all the legends that are at that night. So there were about five or 600 of the biggest names in tennis. It was on the Saturday evening. So it was after the women's final and right before the men's final. And so 
probably the most nervous I've ever been. I've got to be honest, uh, talking in front of all those former greats of the game and current greats of the game. A, a lot of people that were still playing were at that night. But for me also, with Rod being such a special man and, and being so such an idol for all of us young Australians growing up, you know, even with my dad and growing up in our house, whilst it was very much a Port Adelaide family and we'd talk football all the time, one way or another, it would morph into tennis, whether that was sitting up and watching a, a McEnroe Borg final at Wimbledon. As you can see right behind me there, in, in honour of where we should be right now, uh, it's the Wimbledon Centre Court there with the new roof on it. We're actually on day three today if the Wimbledon Championships was going to be played. So I, I was one of the kids, like I'm sure a lot of you guys, that because of the time zone, when Wimbledon finals were on, it was about 11 p.m. at night here in Australia. And I got a chance as a young fellow to sit up and watch those tennis finals with my parents. And uh, my dad would talk about Rod Laver and talk about what he achieved and the person he was. And it's not so much what you achieve inside the lines. It's more about how you act and behave outside the lines that will be your, your destiny, be what people remember you for. And, he was very much into that. And as we know, it's been 50 years since Rod Laver won that Grand Slam. Uh, the, the man he is and the quality of person he is and the way that not just Rod, but a lot of those old tennis players in Roy Emerson, Fred Stolle, John Newcomb, Tony Roach, you know, of course, Rod, that era of tennis player is pretty damn special in what they were able to achieve. And even for someone like myself growing up, I, I grew up with a group of tennis players uh, John Fitzgerald, Wally Masur, Mark Kratzman, Pat Cash, myself. There, there was a whole bunch of players that came through at the same time. And all of the older generation players, whenever they could, would put their arm around us, give us a little bit of advice, come on to the court with us, give us some coaching. And as you know, back then, we didn't have the money the players have now. And you traveled more in a team. And it was more of a team environment back then. And we were all trying to help each other. And I remember... The very first time in 1985, I had the first chance ever. And Neil Fraser and myself, Neil Fraser was the Australian Davis Cup captain back then. And I kind of thought you didn't have to be a tennis player. Of course, I'm from a football family, so my history of tennis wasn't great. And I didn't know that Neil Fraser was actually a tennis player. I thought he was like Harry Hopman, decent tennis player, but, but not a great champion of the game, but an unbelievable coach. And he had this great aura about him as the Davis Cup captain and incredible incredible success so in 83 and 86 we were the uh, Davis Cup champions and in 86 in the semi-finals he asked three players three young juniors to come along it was Mark Kratzman, Simon Ewell and myself and we came as the orange boys so basically we were just there to pick up the balls for Kashi, Peter McNamara, Namid, Fitzy, Mark Edmondson, whoever was in that Davis Cup team. And I was running around doing everything I could to, to practice with the boys, to try to impress Neil Fraser. And I remember vividly that night we were sitting down at dinner and I, me being a suck like I am, I sat right next to Fraser because I wanted to kind of pick his brain and show him how impressive I was and how hardworking I was. And he started telling stories about the old days and remembering I wasn't sure of the history of the game. And he started telling a story about the day that he played Rod Laver at Wimbledon on this court right behind me. And me not even knowing anything, I, I popped up and said, Fraze, you had a chance to play Rod Laver? Oh, my God, that must have been an unbelievable experience. How many games did you win? Because no one beats Rod Laver, right? No one beats him on Wimbledon on centre court. And he gave me this weird look in the table. We've got 15 players on the table. And the table went absolutely quiet. And me not knowing anything, I just kept on going with the conversation. I just, phrase, you know, what was it like playing Rod? You know, how many games did you win? What an experience that was. You know, talk to me about it. It was great. And he looked at me and goes, pow, I beat Rod Laver on Wimbledon, centre court. And I went, nah, bullshit, phrase. There's no way you did that. No one beats Rod Laver. My, talk, my dad told me Rod Laver was undefeated at Wimbledon. He wins every time he played. Anyway, he didn't go on. He didn't say anything after that meeting. And uh, the next day, one of the older boys, I think it was Mark Edmondson, pulled me aside and said, son, you better go do your research because Neil Fraser beat Rod Laver in the 1960 Wimbledon Championships. So I went and did my research and I went up and I apologised to him. And about three months later, we had the Australian Open and Neil Fraser has this barbecue where he gets all the Australian players over. And it's normally at about 7pm. It's on the middle Saturday 
and we'd have about 20 or 25 current Davis Cup players and former Davis Cup players all at his house across in Melbourne. And he gave the invites out to everybody and he came and gave me the invite and it was 5 p.m., two hours before the actual match started, before the, the barbecue started. And so I get there a couple of hours early and I walk in and I didn't know that everyone was coming two hours later and I walk in and Fraze goes, pow, go and sit down there on the couch. And I sit down on the couch and he goes, what do you want to drink? And I said, I'll take a beer. And he brings me out a Coke. <laughs> he gives me a can of Coke. And I'm sitting down and I said, what am I doing here, Fraze? Where is everybody else? And he goes, mate, you're about to get a history lesson. So he goes and puts the VHS tape on the television and plays the 1960 Wimbledon final. And God damn it, I know every single point, every single shot, every single break point opportunity that he had because he made me watch that bloody tape 15 years in a row. And two hours, 47 minutes into the match, he finally hits a mishit forehand that shanks around Rod Laver's backhand volley, which he leaves and lands on the line. And he wins the match, throws his racket up in the air, runs up, jumps the net and gives Rod Laver a hug and Fraser was the 1960 Wimbledon champion. So I actually am responsible for making all the former players sit through that video for two hours every Australian Open barbecue. So it's a bit of a, an in-joke that I had to catch. I may be from a football family, but I had to certainly catch up on my tennis history. <laughs> Darren, you, uh, you touched on a couple of things there that might be worth following through uh, about a young player and a, and a uh, starting out. And it's, you're quoted as, uh, as saying you weren't quite good enough in that sense to go to the AIS but people saw in you something that uh, perhaps you didn't even recognize yourself that you were dedication maybe you got it from your father you were just dedicated to the game and to to, to wanting to do better do you want to just touch on that yeah no that's for sure um, I was a decent player but certainly not a great player and, and growing up in this house I wanted to play football uh, at that stage but my tennis was slightly better than my football and doors were starting to open up a little bit more in junior tennis. But there was a, a gentleman in Melbourne called Bob Carmichael. I'm sure if many of you guys would remember Bob, his nickname was Nails. And he didn't start playing tennis until he was about 25 years of age, meaning full time. He saved enough money to jump onto a boat. He traveled across six weeks on a boat, got across to Europe, didn't have the money to come home. So he spent three years across in Europe, turning himself into a very, very good tennis player. And Bob was responsible for touching most of my generation of players coming through and having a positive impact. Uh, he was a personal coach of Pat Rafter for a couple of years, uh, Simon Yule, Mark Kratzman, pretty much everybody that came through, uh, he was there to help them. But he had a real disciplined attitude. He's a Melbourne supporter, so he loved football. He obviously knew my background, and my dad was coaching Collingwood at the time, so he knew of that as well. And uh, he took a bit of a shine to me, and he could see the work ethic, uh, the way that I went about things. Um, my, actually, my dad gave me a, a, a nice story um, when I was about 14, I reckon, 13 or 14. It was a bit of a history lesson that I got in front of all the old Port Adelaide players. Um, hopefully, everyone remembers Bob Philp. A uh, great foot, Port Adelaide football player, played back in my dad's era. Anyone that's a Port Adelaide supporter back in those days, there is, you'd go back to the games after the match and they would have the presentations for all the players. So if you played well, a lot of the members would put some money into an envelope and then player by player would get called up onto the stage and it would be like a celebration. And we didn't lose all that often, so most times we had a pretty good celebration back then. And I remember as a 14, 15-year-old walking up to the bar and going to get a lemon squash. And you've got to try to walk through the crowd to get up there. And I got up to the bar and I got a tap on my shoulder and the lady's name in the bar was Sue. And I said, uh, Sue, can I have a lemon squash, please? And I got a tap on my shoulder and it was Bob Philp, who was very close to my dad. And Bob said, we used to call him Uncle Bob back then. I said, hey, Uncle Bob. And he goes, what'd you order? And I said, uh, lemon squash. And he goes, ah, come on, mate. You're, you're Jack's son. Jack's son doesn't drink lemon squash. That's for Sheila's, mate. You don't, you don't drink lemon squash. You have to have a beer. It's going to put hair on your chest and lead in your pencil. And I didn't even know what in the hell he was talking about, but Sue puts a beer down in front of me, the bartender, and says, yeah, lemon squash. You don't have lemon squash. You've got to have a beer. So I had this beer for the first time, and I didn't really know what to do with it. And I walked all the way back through the crowd, and then you had the little roped-off area. So now I'm a 14-year-old, and everybody knew me as Jack's son walking back past Brucey Light, 
past Brian Cunningham, past Kim Kinnear, past Bomber Clifford, Russell Ebert, the whole lot, all the players sitting there watching me walk with this beer and put this beer down on my dad's table. And my dad looks at me and goes, what have you got there? And I said, Uncle Bob gave me this because he thinks it's going to put hair in my chest and lead in my pencil. And he goes, do you even know what that means? And I said, no. And he goes, well, you better drink it then. So all of a sudden I felt all these eyes on me and I drank beer for the first time. And anyone who's drunk beer for the first time knows there's a little bit of a kickback. Well, this kickback had beer coming out of my nostrils. I was coughing it up. And one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. And I put the beer down and I got a, a napkin and wiped it off. And he goes, don't worry two things you're going to learn from this look behind you and i looked behind me and russell ebert was looking at me and russell had, russell had a massive smile on his face and he had a glass with a lemon squash in his hand basically giving me a little cheers and i turned around and he goes mate if a lemon squash is good enough for the best damn player that's ever worn the port adelaide jumper it's damn well good enough for you and most importantly about this as well don't follow the lead yet do not follow the leader. When everybody, whenever somebody gives you a little bit of advice, you're smart enough to know right from wrong and what you should do. So just because somebody says you should do something, work out for yourself whether that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Because the right thing to do there would have been saying, Uncle Bob, I'm not old enough to have a beer. I'll have a lemon squash. That'll make you more of a man. But the most important thing you're going to learn from this is Uncle Bob is a dickhead. <laughs> and that is stuck with me forever and ever. And the lesson I learned there was, all right, you've got to grow up fast if you want to be in this family. And I think that was the most important thing that I took through to my career, especially as a tennis player, is that you have to accept responsibility for where you want to go and how good you want to be. Um, the limit is unlimitless. You can be as good as you want to be as long as you, you work in the right way, you work in a smart way. Um, I think if anything, if I had my time again, I felt like I overworked and I could have worked in a much smarter way to be better than I was. But you learn as you go. And I think it's really important that you take responsibility for all your actions. And, and that, you know, I was 13 or 14 years of age back then. And I remember that like yesterday. And I think it was the biggest lesson that I've ever got that, okay, I've got all these greats that I look up to, all my idols in this one room. It could have been the most embarrassing thing in my life but I turned it into a positive and going all right I'm going to show these guys I can make something out of myself and and I think that was a, a pretty important lesson as well. Yeah. Uh, interesting interesting uh, insights there into growing up and young player and, and up and coming it probably is a, a leaping forward a bit but it's a nice segue to a question that Trish one of our members is is wanting you to comment on and feel free to but feel free to avoid if you want to <laughs> Nick Curios, you know, you had the benefit of some great mentors and some great leaders around you. Uh, Nick doesn't appear to respond very well to people giving him advice. What, what's your thought about Nick and his future? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I get it, Trish, I get asked this, especially when I'm working in the US on ESPN, I reckon I get asked this every day for the last what, seven or eight years that he's been around. My... My opinion on him, him, firstly, is this month, he's been player of the month. The stuff that he's done, the way he's spoken about what Novak's done, the way he's spoken about what Alexander Zverev has done, breaking protocols and not putting himself in self-isolation. He's thinking of the greater good of the community, that we all have to be responsible. That's part of the reason why here in Australia, our cases are pretty low compared to the rest of the world, is because all of us is, have taken this very seriously. Um, and the fact he's not letting these players be irresponsible because for tennis, we need the whole world to be responsible for our game to get back in and start going again. All of us are unemployed at the moment. Uh, we rely on our prize money for the players to make money and the coaches rely on the players making money for them to get paid as well. So the quicker the tennis players be responsible and do the right thing, the quicker our game will get back. So I think what Nick has done in the last four weeks, I'm really proud of him. I think he's done an amazing job. The fact he's speaking up, out and holding players accountable shows a side to him that people needed to see because if you talk to Nick's friends, they will say that's normal Nick. That's what he's like. He's very much a family man, uh, talks and speaks what he wants and, and how he feels, but 
but most of it is a lot of common sense and a lot of it is from the heart and you've got to admire that. It's different when it comes to his tennis because I'm not sure that any coach that was to take him on at the moment would make a big impact or a big difference in the way he plays because he's not looking for that. He's not looking to be coached. He's not looking to put structure around him. He's not looking for someone there to push him. He wants to do things his own way and he wants to go about it as hard as he wants or as easy as he wants. And quite often on the court also, if things are getting a little bit too hard or if things are getting to him mentally or physically, he's breaking down a little bit, he looks for the exit door. And that's when you see the, the not trying kick in and, and the frustration take over as well. If you have a coach there pushing him all the time, it's just going to clash because he's not looking to be pushed in those moments. There'll come a time, I think, what is he about, about 24, 25 years of age? I reckon there will come a time in the next couple of years where he'll go, all right, I don't want to look back on my career and wonder what if, and I'll, I'm going to get someone. And the person that he gets, I think, it's the tricky thing about coaching is that the biggest thing and the biggest struggle that we have as tennis coach is to find the purpose. If we can find the purpose for why the player is playing, then we can structure a program around that to make them and keep them happy, keep them motivated, keep that work ethic up. If we can't find the purpose, if we can't find the why, everyone's is different. It could be money. It could be fame. It could be enjoying the travel. It could be the life you get to lead as a tennis player. Whatever that purpose is, that's how you have to structure a training regime around that. And Trish, I don't know if you know, finding Nick's purpose is not easy, right? Um, because it seems to go different from day to day. It could be one day he loves basketball and he doesn't want to be on the tennis court and he wants to be out playing basketball with his mates. Some days if he's playing Rafa Nadal, he has real purpose because he and Rafa are not the greatest of mates and he really wants to beat him. And that's his purpose is to, to play the best players in the world on the biggest courts with packed audiences. I, I think Nick would be one of those players here during COVID-19 that even if the US Open was going and he decided to go play, if you put him in Arthur Ashe Stadium with no fans, no matter who he was playing, that would be tough for him because I don't think he'd be able to get himself up. He wouldn't be able to find that inner drive to push himself through that to try to chase the victory because there's a little bit of showman in him as well. So it's a tricky question, Trish. I don't have an easy answer for it because he's a complicated young man. But I think in the next couple of years, I'm hoping that he's going to, to think that, you know what, I'm going to try to put someone next to me. It might be a coach. It might be a hitting partner. It might be a psychologist. It could be a best mate, whoever it may be, that can help him get the best out of himself. But that person will need to know him really well. We'll need to spend a lot of time with him to get to know him well. Once you do that, then you can start to structure a program around him that can help him improve a little bit quicker. But a tricky question for sure. Thank you. Well, come, come, might pop back to that in a moment with, with another uh, question. But I just wanted to take you to, you, you've, you've chosen tennis, um, you've got some advice, and you joined the circuit. And the circuit when you were playing is a damn sight different, I think, to the circuit that perhaps Nick's playing on at the moment with hotels and a team and a support crew and so on. Tell us a little bit about your days on the circuit, particularly goodness sake, sleeping in bomb shelters. Yeah, it's a better player than I was as well. So Nick, as a young age, I think he got through to the quarterfinals at Wimbledon at a pretty young age. So the money kicked in pretty quickly, the fame kicked in pretty quickly, and he was a much better younger player than I was. It took me a few years to get to that sort of top 20 ranking, whereas it came pretty early for him. Yeah, it was completely different back then. And I'm not the only player, pretty much. Ever. Unless you were Pat Cash, who was the standout player back then, all of us uh, did it pretty tough. And you would go away and you'd buy an air ticket. You would stay away until the money ran out. That could be three months. That could be six months, whatever it took. Uh, we didn't have the option that if we were getting a little bit homesick to jump on a plane and come home because we didn't have Tennis Australia paying for our tickets back then. Basically, we were spending our parents' money or our money. So you had to make it last. And the only way you made it last if you weren't winning many matches is to cut down on the expenses. So yeah, we, we quite often we would, in Switzerland especially, they had these huge bomb shelters that they built throughout the war and they would rent them out to, I guess, 
touring groups that would go through there and they were five Swiss francs a night. They had a huge safe door on them and they'd close that door at about 6 p.m. every night and come back at 6 a.m. the next morning, 12 hours, open the door. And there were about 40 of us on bunk beds just staying in those, those bomb shelters um, every night during those tournaments. So we were saving, saving some money on accommodation. And if we could win a couple of matches in those tournaments, we could put a little bit of money in the bank and extend our tour overseas. But once you got to about 150 in the ranking, then you were starting to get into some of the bigger tournaments and you were starting to make some money. And it took me until I was about 21, I think, before I started to break into the top 150. And then um, then the pressure comes off a little bit. Then you start to not worry about the prize money. You just start to worry about the wins and the ranking and doing a lot more work into breaking down your opposition. Um, but for a lot of players, as you know, that doesn't happen. For At the moment on the AFL list, we have about 800 footballers. And all of those 800 footballers, no matter what you're making, are actually putting a little bit of money in the bank because they don't have any work-related expenses. The work-related expenses for tennis players is enormous, you know, from the travel, from the accommodation, from the coaching, uh, just the things that you've got to pay for, everything comes out of your pocket. So even back in my day, which was 30 or 40 years ago, 150 players around the world, if you're ranked in the top 150 players, you were putting some money in the bank. If you were not, you were probably losing money. And it's still the same today. Even though the money has probably gone 20 times what it was back then, it's still 150 players that are making money out of the game of tennis. So we need as a tour, the WTA tour and the ATP tour to, to find a way to push that money to the lower ranked players to make sure that we can give more jobs to more people. You, you know, you were, you were working hard, you were traveling hard, you were living hard and then injury struck and you decided to, uh, to give away the game and turn to coaching. Uh, do you want to touch on that, on your coaching career so far? Well, I've been very lucky. Uh, I've had three great players and Leighton, I had a, a young Leighton Hewitt with his hat backwards. It's my wife doing the printing here. She doesn't know I'm in here. I don't know if you can hear that printer noise coming off the back here. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, my, um, I got very lucky as a 12 year old. Leighton knocked on my door, had his hat backwards, had big rackets over his back, uh, long shorts. He looked exactly like a young Andre Agassi back then. And uh, he asked if he'd, I'd hit a few tennis balls with him. And, uh, my wife now, who was also my girlfriend back then, uh, saw me out the back playing tennis with him. And quite often I would hit with a, a lot of the young players here in South Australia. And I came off the court after spending a couple of hours with him as a 12 year old. And she looked at me and she goes, whoa, you looked impressed. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> this kid is the, he's the best I've ever seen at 12 years of age. Uh, the way he moves, his shot selection, his intensity. Uh, you can see the fire in the belly this kid has at 12 years of age. So... As it happened, I would continue along with his other coach here, Peter Smith in South Australia, who did an unbelievable job with his technique. So Peter was look, looking after him with his technique. And I was kind of the guy that would help him play, you know, teaching him where to position himself in the court, the shot selection, how to break down opponents, the, the game of tennis, the strategy of tennis. And together, uh, we worked with him until he was about 16 or 17. And then he was good enough to go on the road and, and go pro. And that's when I went away with him for about three years. And his rise up the ranking was unbelievable to see him take on some of the greatest players in the world. You felt like a stiff breeze could blow him over. He was so small and light, yet here he is on the centre court of, of Queen's Club a week before Wimbledon, taking on Pete Sampras in the final and sending Pete's serve back faster than Pete was serving it and, and cutting down anything that Pete was able to throw on him. And I think he won that championship three or four times at Queen's Club and then finally breaking through and winning the Wimbledon Championships. It was an amazing ride to, to see him do what he did. But also interesting because you make mistakes. That was my first real pro coaching gig. And looking back, there are things that I could have done better throughout that period. Uh, I think the one thing that I did well is I stayed out of his way a lot. I think when you have a really great player, the temptation to overcoach can certainly be there and you can actually halt the progress of great players by putting too many boundaries around them but I, I was letting him go out there and, and make mistakes and, and learn from those mistakes and try to get better through experience and I think that was one of the better things I did so with that I got a call in 2002 
to look after Andre Agassi. That was an interesting call, actually, because right at that time in 2002, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And Marat Safin's management had made an approach to me. My wife was pumped. I'm sure you guys may have heard this story. My wife was pumped about the fact that I was going to coach Marat Safin because she used to call him the big, hot, sexy Russian. And her and the girlfriends would go off to Melbourne Park every year and go and watch his matches, unbeknownst to me. I was coaching Leighton Hewitt and she was off watching Marat Safin. And so when I got the approach to coach Marat, she was fired up. She said, you've got to take that job. Don't even worry about the money. That's a perfect job for you. And I'm like, all right, slow down, slow down. And so as it happened, um, the Australian Open went about. Um, he lost in the final to Thomas Johansson. A week later, I got a call from Andre. And I was a little bit worried about taking the Safin job because of the reputation that Marat has. And Andre called me up. He said, listen, I've seen the work that you've done with, with Leighton. Uh, I'm looking to, I'm 32 years of age. I promise you that I can get better. I know I can, even though I'm 32 years of age. Most tennis players are retired by now. But I reckon there's still more improvement in me. I want someone around that's had great experience with someone like Leighton. Uh, he looks like he rarely ever hits the wrong shot. I'm sure you're partly responsible for that. And I've had eight great years with Brad Gilbert. Um, I, I'd love you to come and coach me. I told him about the approach that I had Marat with Marat. And he said, hey, listen, I get it. I understand it. Think it through and maybe get back to me when you can in a couple of days. I hung up the phone and not 10 minutes later, he called me back. And he said, hey, listen, I've been thinking about this offer you've got from Marat. That's a miss because that guy's a loose cannon, a runaway train. I promise you, I'm going to jump into the trenches. I'll do whatever you ask. You're going to come over here. It's going to be a great life in Las Vegas. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to play for. It might be one year. It might be five years. But I promise you I'll do my best to get back to number one in the world. I'll do my best to win more Grand Slams. And the worst thing of all, if you take that job, is your wife is probably going to fall in love with Marat. <laughs> so I said, I'll take the job. So two weeks later, I was across in Las Vegas. Uh, my wife, our little boy, Benjamin, who was nine months old at that stage, and with Andre and his boy, Jaden, Jaden Agassi, who was three months old. And I've got to remember that the... the Funniest part about it was I was nervous as hell, no question, because Andre, to me, even though he was my era and I played against him, he was kind of bigger than life as a tennis player. You know, he was one of those guys who took tennis from the back pages, the sport pages, to the front pages, to the business pages, to the entertainment pages. Like, his life was kind of everything. He was like Bjorn Borg. He, he was our version of Bjorn Borg. And so there was a lot of mystery around him. And then he went and married Steffi Graf. So in this house, you've got Steffi, who's won 22 Grand Slam singles titles. And you've got Andre, who's won seven Grand Slam singles titles. So holy shit, we're walking into a house of 29 Grand Slam singles titles. And my, my wife on the flight over, Victoria, says, what are you going to teach this guy? Like, he's 32 years of old. So how are you going to improve this guy? And it was a damn good question, right? Because you don't know if his game's sliding backwards at years of age. But I'd done my research, and I did all my work, and we walked into the house, and they were great. They made it feel like there was not a single trophy to be seen anywhere. It was a beautiful house. Um, we had a room in San Francisco. It was in Tiburon in San Francisco, and some of the most expensive real estate in the world. We walked into this room, and it's all Steph has decked it out beautifully, and we've got a little baby cot there, and one window in our room, we could see the Golden Gate Bridge. The other window, we can see the Bay Bridge. We're looking across all this water, and my wife looks at me and goes, yeah, stuff Marat. Good call, killer. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> this is a bloody job. You don't, don't stuff this up, for Christ's sake. So I went, oh, my God, the pressure's on. And that night, we had a, we had a dinner that night. And it was, it was like a movie out of a scene. It was, I can remember it like yesterday. Huey Lewis from Huey Lewis and the News, the singer. Robin Williams, um, Marsha Williams, his wife. Gil Reyes, who was the strength and conditioner trainer flew up from Las Vegas to be at this dinner. So it was like a, a welcome for Victoria and myself to the Agassi house. And he had all these celebrities at this table. And he's giving margaritas and beers and cooked big steaks. And the food was unbelievable. And we all sit down at this table. There was about 16 or, 16 or 18 of us. And he knocks his glass with a spoon and says, hello, everyone. Just like to welcome my new coach, Darren, and his wife, Victoria, to the to, to Tiburon. He's going to be my new coach. And we've feel like we're going to have great things. But the one question I want to ask Darren, and the one thing I would like Darren to tell everybody here is, 
how am I going to beat Leighton Hewitt? That was the very first question in front of everybody. And it was my first test. And as I said before, I was well prepared. So I had about a 10 or a 15 minute. And I knew that question was coming for sure. Because at that stage, Leighton was number one in the world. I think Andre was about six or seven in the world. But Leighton had beaten him the last couple of times. So I knew Leighton's game was frustrating him. So I had about a 10, 15 minute spiel that I was going to, to roll out. I thought we were going to roll it out privately. But now here I am rolling it out in front of Robin and Marsha Williams and Huey Lewis and all these other people. And anyway, it went really well. Um, as soon as I finish, he goes, oh, this is going to be a good partnership. And then we went to work and, and went for five years. And as most people know, 33 and a half years of age, he got back to number one in the world and he won the Australian Open and finished his career in 2006. And I think he spent more time in the top 10 than any other player. All of those records that he had, I've been eclipsed since by, by Roger Federer. But at the time, he held a lot of records for the oldest ever number one. Um, and, and so it was a pretty amazing ride. And I learned a lot with him. He was very different in the sense with Leighton. You, it's like a caged bull. You know, one of the things with Leighton is to, to find a way to fire him up, give him some strategy, but basically just open the gate, let him out there and go, go get him. And, and Leighton would do it. Andre was very much analytical that he wanted to know 20 different things about what his opponent may or may not do. If he was playing Richard Gasquet from France, okay, what happens if I hit the ball hard and fast into his forehand? Is he going to take that ball on the rise and hold his position? Or is he going to fall back a little bit and play that ball with a little more spin? Will that ball be dropped a little bit short where I can attack it? But what if I serve him wide? If I serve him wide, is he likely to chip that return back? Or can I do a sneaky serve and volley? Or will he go for the big forehand down the line? Because I don't like that forehand down the line when players do that. So, he had 20 or 30 different questions about every single opponent that he wanted to imagine how the match was going to play out before he actually played the match, which my dad actually was very much into the imagery of the match. Think about how you're going to win that match. See that match being played out in your mind before you actually play it. And when you walk onto the court, when you get into those moments when you're 4-2 up, 40-30, trying to close out a match, You've already played that point four or five times in your mind. So you know what's going to happen. You know how it should play out. So Andre was very much in that mindset as well. Simona was completely different. Uh, Simona, the women's game is a little more emotional and it's much more important to spend the time to understand what's going through the player's mind and why they're making certain decisions they are. So it's spent, it took me a lot more time to be more effective with Simona than it did with the two, two guys because also the pressure that she was under being Romanian, there's 20, 20 million Romanians and tennis is by far the number one sport in Romania. Dealing with that pressure, being someone who's about five foot five and a half, five foot six, uh, all the focus is on her. Every win she has, the country rides that win. Every loss, she has, the, the country mourns that loss. Uh, they critique it, they break it down. It's a bit like the Crows and Port after every weekend. They do that just with her after every single match. So it took me a while to understand the pressure she was under and that French Open loss that she had in 2017 to Yelena Ostapenko after being up a set in the break. I can't, I can't describe to you how crushing that was for her to lose that match and how much she impressed me as a person to be able to put that loss to one side and come back through just sheer hard work and to make herself stronger mentally and stronger as a player and finally break through and win that tournament the next year in 2018 and then to go on and win this tournament behind me in 2019. She's a remarkable young woman and I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with her. It's been my most challenging coaching assignment for sure, but certainly one where I've learned a lot. Thanks. We, we're just moving along a bit, but before we get to the next uh, phase or, or era of the conversation, Zing Hai asked an interesting question about gamesmanship and the fact that Brad Gilbert was a master at game, playing games. Uh, any comment on that, Darren? Uh, Brad's one of my best friends. Uh, I love Brad. We, we speak, the guy's up at four in the morning. He drives me nuts. So for the but the time slot here in Australia is quite good. So when he gets up and he wants somebody to speak to and he calls me at four in the morning, it's okay. But when I'm in the US, in Las Vegas, we're on the same time zone. I'll wake up at 6.30, 7 o'clock, which is still early for me. And I've got seven missed calls from Brad, for sure, every single day. 
Uh, Brad, Brad to me is the master at taking a snapshot of somebody's game and being able to break it down. So he can look at somebody for five minutes and go, that person does this well, this well, this well, but this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. You need to work on this. He's got an unbelievable tennis analytical mind, but he's all over the place a little bit. He's with different sports. He's a basketball freak, a football freak. Um, so all the way, he's always looking for a bit of an edge to, to get the victory. And that's why he wrote that book, actually, which is a pretty good read. Um, a lot of the stuff is stuff that we knew already as tennis players, but when he verbalized it and people read it for the first time, we took it for granted, a lot of it as tennis players. But when and it, wrote was, that book, it was coming from a peer rather than uh, right. somebody from the outside. Yeah, uh, so he did a really good job with that. And he, the, the one thing that he'll complain about, if you ever get to speak about it, is he never made any money out of the book. You know, it's been the number one best-selling book before Andre's book Open, which was released. And I think it went to number one bestseller in the New York Times. Before that one came out, Brad's has been the number one best-selling book in tennis, but he never made any money out of it. And that's, that's typical, Brad. Uh, th there's a question. Danny's asked a question, which, in fact, will take another whole session. So I'll just cut it down. He's asking about the qualities of being a champion. Yeah. Is there one thing that stands out to make someone a champion, do you think? There's five things. And I talk about this all the time, actually, when I do a little bit of presenting with young tennis players and even in the high performance space, there are five things I think that you can see through every champion in tennis. And the first one goes without saying it's work ethic. If you don't have great work ethic, you won't get there. You see a lot of players that have incredible talent that will never turn that talent into being a great champion unless you have great work ethic. Purpose, as I said before, You've got to find that purpose. Why you get up every morning, it's the same for your job, your normal job as well. If you're not inspired by what you're doing, you'll never be great at what you do. And so for our jobs as coaches is to find that purpose and what makes the player tick. If you can find that purpose, your job of coaching effectively is much, much easier. All the great champions have belief. They all believe it regardless of whether or not it's happening or not. Even though Simona failed in her first three Grand Slam singles finals deep down, she had incredible belief. I think if coach can help bring that belief out more and bring it to the fore, uh, you do that a lot by conversations, um, trust, uh, sh not being too emotional in the big moments, making sure that uh, through the bad times and through the good times, you're a little more flatlined as a coach and, and the player really gets great belief in that. Resilience. Resilience is only built up through experience and that can be experienced through the juniors or through the seniors but you have to have resilience in our game because tennis is such a brutal sport, both mentally, physically, you're spending 30, 30 to 40 weeks away from home, most of the players. You build up a great resilience uh, through just experience. And the one thing, so that are the four things, work ethic, purpose, belief, and resilience. The one thing that I will say that, especially in tennis, and you could probably say this for a lot of team sports as well, is, the team you have around you is incredibly important. And you can just go to uh, people like Federer. If you look at Federer, he's had the same coach for 15 plus years. I know he brings in other coaches from time to time, but he's had that Severin Luthi, who's been with him for about 15 years. He's had that consistency. Djokovic has had Marion Viner. Serena Williams has had Patrick Moradoglu. Ash Barty has had ties for the last four or five years. And Nadal has had Uncle Tony and now Carlos Moya. The players in our game that are looking for the magic bullet to come from a coach where they're struggling a little bit and they think, okay, I'm going to change the coach because a new coach might bring me something that I'm missing. They're the ones that will struggle and they will always struggle. There are a lot of great coaches in our sport and tennis. And unless you build up those four things that I said before, it's not going to work. So you look through all the great players in our game the team aspect and the consistency of the team. And it's a little bit like we were talking about, Pete, in football as well. You can, you can say the thing with, with Vossi and um, Kenny Hickley at the moment is that you know, we've had that same group now for a number of years and it takes time to build up that belief uh, with the players. And I can honestly tell you, it's a nice segue to the football as well, I can honestly tell you that the group at the moment, the culture within Port Adelaide, the togetherness of the group of the players and the coaches is stronger than it's ever been. And that's because of the work those guys have done the last three or four years. And it takes a long time. 
Now they have a chance for success. If you don't have that, it's very rare that you can have champions. So I think those five things are really important. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, well, I think we might bottle those actually, <laughs> and maybe that'll be the t chapter important chapters in your forthcoming memoir, uh, which a number of people have said online that they'd love to read. Um, I just in the few minutes remaining, I just want to talk about the current situation, the present. Uh, this morning, an article in the paper about a, an unnamed football team and an unnamed player having a bit of a bleat about maybe having to go somewhere else and being away from the family and all that sort of stuff. COVID has created some incredible stresses and pressures upon people. Um, what's your overall impression of COVID? Uh, the US Open going ahead, N Novak Djokovic's uh, you know, performance, if you will, in yeah. recently in the tournament, the whole football hub thing. Can you just give us your insight into what you think is happening and what will come out of the COVID situation? Well, on football, firstly, I think that the football player is not used to what tennis players are used to. We, we make a choice as tennis players is that this is our life. This is what we choose to do. We'll get onto a plane and we're going to go for it. So we get to choose that. In fact, I grew up with a tennis player uh, who was a great tennis player, in fact, better than me back in the junior days, called Todd Viney. Todd Viney was a state champion here in South Australia. Great Melbourne player. Exactly. He didn't like the life. So when he was 17 or 18, he decided not. He flew back from Switzerland, gave up tennis, and decided to, to play football, played for Sturt, and became the Melbourne Football Club captain. So um, it's not for everybody, but it's our choice. Footballers are a little bit different. So I have some empathy for what they're going through. Um, if a footballer is not used to being away from the family or if you've got a, a wife that's about to give birth, no problems. I, I don't think anybody should be forced to go into a hub. But there are some big, big positives to doing it because it also, as we go back to this culture thing, it gives the players and the coaches a chance to bond in a way that they haven't had a chance to do before. And if you go into the hub with the right attitude and the right desire, it can be a great thing for you and you'll miss it. The players, I think, especially from Port Adelaide, regardless if they beat Brisbane this weekend, will come back to Adelaide. They'll disperse to their families. And they'll go back to their regular routines. But a lot of the stories they'll talk about for the next couple of years will come from this little three or four week experience they've had in the hub because it is a great time to spend together and especially while they're going through this winning as well. As far So football, I think AFL is doing a good job. I think that it's really important to keep the sport going I think they're doing the best they can. I think to a certain point, we as human beings are going to have to live with COVID-19, at least in the short term, because unless a vaccine comes along, and as you know, uh, not all vaccines, not all of these viruses are cured by vaccines. I think COVID-19 is going to be a little part of our life for a long, long time. I think a lot of the social distancing things that have been put in place are good things for us to go on with life as normal, I think, uh, regardless. Uh, speaking of Brad Gilbert, Brad Gilbert will never shake hands with anybody. He hasn't done that for 20 years because he's worried about catching germs. And he has a little bottle of the hand sanitizer in his, in his pocket, which he's been traveling with for 20 years. So he's all over this social distancing. And I think this is going to become more of a part of everybody's life. And that's not a bad thing as well. As far as tennis is concerned, it's too early. Because we're trying to, in Australia, we can control it to a certain extent and it's here and it's in one country and our borders are closed in Australia. We have 150 countries, different countries competing in Davis Cup and Fed Cup. So we need 150 countries to come in line with all the border restrictions, all everything that they've got in place and allow players to fly to New York and compete in this bubble event and then put the restrictions around the players in this bubble event. And then after they finish in New York, as it stands right at the moment, anyone who plays in that tournament, when they go back to Europe to play some European tournaments, they have to go into a 14-day self-isolation period. So for me, I think it's better for tennis to play it safe and start again next year and start here in Australia where we know we can control it and it is being controlled. But as you know, money speaks. And yep. US Open is a big tournament. It creates a lot of money for a lot of pe people and especially for junior development and for grassroots. So I understand why they're trying to get it up and going. But if I had my way, I would play the patient game. Play the long game. Thank you. Um, I, I, Heidi will forgive me for just asking one more last yeah. quick question. 
um, it's her first time as president chair chairing the meeting, so I don't <laughs> want to go over to time. Go for it. It's just so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it is. Isn't it? Um, yeah. One of your protege has got the shortest arms and the longest pockets in tennis. Leighton Hewitt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a bet for showdown. Has he paid up yet? Well, the answer is no. No, he hasn't paid. He's got alligator arms. He never reaches into his pocket when he when he loses a bet. Um, from the first day I met him, uh, he's oh, you know his dad, Glenn Hewitt, was a very good player here. I think he played for Woodville, didn't he? It was, it was at Woodville, and then he may have played a stint somewhere else as well. In fact, I think he actually went across to the VFL and played a year over there. And he was a really good player, but he's always grown up a Crows fan. And uh, when he took on me as a Port Adelaide coach, uh, we've always been at it in a fun way, back and forth. So we'll quite regularly have a bet on the showdowns. And uh, there was a period there where Crows were whacking us twice a year and I would pay up my bets, but no, Rusty has not paid his bet. It was supposed to be a slab of beer. You know, the actual truth of that story was I sent him a message. We have a, we have a super coach group. Anyone that plays super coach will know it. So there's 20 football, uh, 20 ex tennis players that have a super coach group against each other. So we're all ex tennis players or current tennis players. And I sent him a message on the group saying, Rusty, you want to have a bet for the upcoming showdown? If I win, you've got to put a Port Adelaide prison bar jumper on and put it on your Twitter and Instagram accounts for a week. And if you win, the Crows win, I'll do the same with a Crows jumper. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm not that confident about the Crows winning this one. <laughs> this is better slab of beer. So a slab of beer it was. And no, old alligator arms hasn't paid up the bet. So we'll see if that comes. Darren, uh Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, and I, I'm sure uh, without too much arm twisting, uh, President Heidi may invite you to come back and be with us live sometime in the future. Um, you've, you've given us some great insights into uh, to a whole range of things, leadership, uh, things that you learned from your dad about coaching and leading. leading. Uh, you talked about Nick Kyrgios and the fact that perhaps Andre Agassi made the phone call that Nick needs to make at the right time that suits Nick. It's been absolutely phenomenal and insightful. And uh, I just wanted to quickly share our screen for everybody. We like to thank everybody and thank our speakers for their time by making a donation in their name to eradication of polio as part of the End Polio Now project that Rotary's been doing. And uh, so on that note, there's the certificate which will be coming your way fairly shortly oh, uh, i'll stop I'll, I'll stop sharing and and i won't talk anymore just to say thank you very much and i'll ask all of the members to uh, to unmute if possible and to thank darren in the usual manner thanks, thank you guys and thanks, well done with everything you guys do as well thanks for everything Thanks, mate. Over, to, over to, back to you, Heidi. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Darren. What an absolute joy and pleasure it was for you to join us today and for our last Zoom meeting. Um, that was just amazing. Thank you so much for your passion and the joy in your voice talking about all the stories and um, uh, just phenomenal. What an incredible life you've lived so far and many, many more years to come. Uh, you and I are the same age, I realise, too. So, um, yeah. 45. Tennis. We're 45, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it's funny because growing up as a kid, tennis was a big thing in my life, too. Um, um, my my next-door neighbours had a tennis court, which, you know, these days most average people don't have tennis courts, but they could have a tennis court in their backyard, you know. And uh, it was um, – we played tennis and went to the um, – Memorial Drive and watch your, I remember trying to get John Alexander's autograph one day in the middle of a game. You were able to actually go down that close to the players. And I remember asking him, oh, could I have your autograph, please? I was probably 10 with my autograph book. And I never forget, he looked at me, he was so angry. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 not during the game. And I'll never forget that. I just snuck away but you were able to get that close to tennis players legends back then <laughs> and um yeah it was it was certainly a wonderful wonderful um opportunity to to learn a lot about ten tennis and it really embedded in me the love for the game so yeah. um 
really great to hear all those stories about the players. I love your story about Uncle Bob, the Uncle Bob lesson in particular. Yeah, didn't know where that was going, but I love love the the end of that. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Darren. And when you when you can come to Adelaide again, we'd love to have you join us at one of our meetings at any Pleasure. time. So Adelaide, yeah. everyone, and I'll let you guys uh, continue on and uh, okay. all the best and uh, go the power. <laughs> thanks, Bye. Darren. Bye. See ya. All right. Well, that was certainly worth going over over a few minutes today. Thanks so much, Pete. That was uh, a fantastic, fantastic talk, and um, I can see why everybody's comments how how brilliant that was. Um, what a wonderful South Australian. What a wonderful person. So next week, uh, just to close off today's meeting, um, we'd like to, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's joined us online today, members and guests. Um, we're back at Adelaide Oval face-to-face -face next week. So please join us um, next Wednesday where we'll have some time for fellowship, hear what members have been up to over the past few months, uh, learn a bit about the new Rotary theme, Rotary Opens Opportunities. And for, for members, we'll have our new club directories available for you to collect on that day. Please don't forget to order your yoghurt from Joe Fieldler uh, by the end of, of the day. Some beautiful yoghurt there to, to choose from with money raised going to the Nurture Kits for Nurses. Um, don't forget to book online for next week's meeting and um, I'll send everybody the link now. Um, if you can book now, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, before Monday would be wonderful. Um, and with that, I'll close the meeting and I'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.